Hi, guys. Welcome to Real Food Recovery. We have a very special guest here with us today, and we are going to get to her. But before I give it away, I have to say hello to my partner, Jamie. How's it going? Hi. Good to be here. Good to see you, as always. Uh, happy to be on Real Food Recovery today. Today, we do have a, a very, very cool episode and an awesome guest. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Lori Marbus. And um, I, uh, I'll i read Dr. Marbus's bio in a moment, but, but Dr. Marbus has a um, just a wonderful, wonderful way about her that um, she brings her knowledge, brings her wisdom in to the people that she works with, the people that she lectures to, speaks to, uh, interviews with, and she makes... Um, I would say not only medicine, but the whole food plant-based approach to medicine, um, very relatable. So Dr. Marvis is a double board certified family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician. She's been utilizing food as medicine since 2012. And not only does she utilize food as medicine for treatment, she walks the talk herself. Uh, she currently holds 50 state medical licenses, including DC, across the US. She's got a small concierge practice at drmarbus.com. She is co-founder of The Healing Kitchen with Brittany Giroudi, who I'm so excited. I can't wait to talk to you more about this, this venture. And their, their goal with Dr. Marbus and Brittany is really giving a platform where a chef and a doctor can come together in a kitchen to provide a recipe of health I really believe, and Paige, I know you feel strongly that these two things go hand in hand in food addiction recovery. She was a former co-founder of Mora Medical and Plant-Based Telehealth. She was instrumental in creating and was the first managing partner for the Plantrition Project's International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. She's also the host of the Dr. Lori Marvis podcast whose mission is to provide resources that will empower individuals with the knowledge, mindset, and inspiration to successfully adopt lifestyle interventions and achieve health and well-being. During her time in Colorado, Dr. Marvis persuaded a large hospital to create a lifestyle medicine program centered around a whole food plant-based diet. The program showed resounding success. At another hospital, she conducted a one-month study of 26 employees on a whole food plant-based diet. All employees were fed from the hospital's kitchen, which is, which is, as we all know, not what people think of when they think of hospital food. And each individual experience improved health. Mm -hmm. She has spoken at the Golden Veg Fest in Colorado, the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, and other venues teaching about the value of a whole food plant-based diet. Lori received her dual degrees, MD and MBA from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Medicine and the Texas Tech University School of Business. She was awarded the university's School of Medicine Gold-Headed Cane Award, a symbol for excellence in the art of medicine and the care of patients. She wrote seven books while in medical school, six of which were in a series called Visual Mnemonics. These books helped, these books used cartoons to help people memorize vast amounts of information, a system that helped her personally when she was a mob attending medical school. As a US Air Force veteran, she served in the Middle East and South America. She's also a wife, mom of three, grown children now, author, speaker, and avid runner. Uh, she is an inspiration in so many ways. I don't know anybody who was able to go to med school, raise a child, children, and write six books. That is uh, impressive to say the least. Um, and here's my personal story of Dr. Marvis. I got to work with her as a patient. Uh, a few years ago, and it really, it really changed my life. I had worked, I came to work with Dr. Marvis. It was at a place in my health journey where I felt like I was in a good spot, um, you know, from, from a weight perspective and a health perspective, but I knew I wanted to refine a few things. Um, so I worked with her directly to sit down and look at the things that we could refine from my diet and my lifestyle. And um, she had me, you know, for 90 days do a very targeted specific approach to data collection not only the food I was eating, but but the lifestyle I was living and even had me wear a continuous glucose monitor for just one month, just to, just to get some data and see what the food was doing inside my body. And um, we learned so much. And at the end of the, um, at the end of the sort of 90 days, we came back together and she said, you're going to live forever. And I just thought <laughs> as a woman who at right at 33 years old thought, I'm not going to make it to 40 to have Dr. Marvis give me 
that um, that kind of feedback, it was it was just life changing. It really mm -hmm. was. I felt like I I had finally come out from under this rock of of addiction that I'd been carrying for so long and obesity that I'd been carrying for so long. She gave me a new lease uh, in so many ways. Um, so I, I have deep gratitude for you, Dr. Marbus. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, I am too. And when she's reading all this, you know, the first thing I want to say, is that all she's done? <laughs> is that it? <laughs> is there more? But, you know, uh, Dr. Marbus and I were talking a little bit before we started recording about how some people are just kind of, they come here genetically pre-wired and are destined for greatness. Obviously you have accomplished a, a huge amount in your, I'm going to say short lifetime for what all you've done. Do you feel like you came to this earth pre-wired for this greatness, or did you have this defining moment of, I'm going to be a type triple A and I'm going to start doing this, 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 and this, or like I said, it did it just, it was it just natural to you? Well, first of all, I have <laughs> such deep gratitude for that warm and lovely introduction. I thank you. I'm humbled and uh, <laughs> um, have the yeah, utmost respect for you, Jamie T. Um, and I'm sure you too, Paige, I, I, as I get to know you. Um, first, call me Lori, please. Um, uh, that's a really fantastic question. And I think my answer would have been different one year, two, three years ago, I would say, mm -hmm. um, for me, I think we're all destined for greatness and life circumstances will set us up for different, uh, so to speak journeys. And it's really up to us. I think this is where the point of, um, acceptance and reflection and understanding that the circumstances that you're born in does not dictate your future. And um, that was the case for me. I came from a very, uh, I don't know what I mean to say, uh, dysfunctional and um, a place of scarcity and struggle with my family unit. Um, not that I uh, disregard, you know, I appreciate they've done the best they could. And, but what I am so thankful about those circumstances, it was painful in the beginning. And as I, you know, grew up and dealt with things, um, I, I see now where I had to be presented those opportunities to have time for growth and reflection and become a better human being, not just the human, but the being part is really important to me these days. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I think it just is a matter of, yes, you can be set, given a set of circumstances, you can choose to see them as limited or unlimited. And okay. I think the coolest thing is when you come from, quote unquote, what we would in this world judge as limited, we can really find opportunity that is much greater than those who maybe come with more, more choices in the form of, you know, things and opportunities in the sense of somebody handing you stuff because when you have to look deep within yourself and understand that this acceptance of this moment and that life is going to be uh continuously changing right because you choose not to accept these limited circumstances that allowed you to be open to such a greater amount of mm -hmm. unlimitless everything and um if someone could just start life with that attitude whether you come from a, a, a wonderful family unit or not, um, there's, there's going to be so many wonderful things happen in this earth. And um, that really is where I think that for me, destiny is in the sense of we all have it within us, that being, and uh, every single one of us has greatness because we're all part of the life force that, you know, makes this place the way it is. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that would be, I think the answer for that for now sounds like you tapped into you got out of you got out of the way so to speak you let you know that your past uh not mm -hmm. hold you back enough so that you could tap into this life force and it took some time right sure. so that's actually what i was going to ask you is if yeah. did you recognize it when you were young or did it take you um, know i think what i saw in the beginning i was very blessed with two very dear, dear friends that had uh, families that modeled 
what could be in a healthy relationship. And I would still even see that's uh, superficial on the surface of really understanding your life essence and who we are. And, um, but as I grew, I think there was a, a period of my life, I had a very much a victim mentality of, you know, I would look at others and go, man, I wish I could have had whatever, whatever. Oh, I wish I could have had whatever, whatever. And what was interesting, the attitude brought me even more suffering, right? It brought me totally. to a place that I I was never going to crawl out of the hole that I put myself in because I kept removing the ladder. Um, someone right. could throw me a thousand lifelines. And if I choose not to see them, I'm not going to climb out of the hole. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that goes with anything. Um, but it, it took, there was an opportunity that was presented to me, a very painful opportunity, um, I'd say about 14 years ago or so that really shook me to my core and allowed me to see um, that this was not okay. And uh, it, I've only been a better person for it. I had to, apparently I'm quite stubborn. <laughs> and so I have to be thrown some serious life lessons um, to get my attention. Uh, and so I think type A personalities, those who are successful sometimes have to go through the greatest suffering um, in order to just return and go, you know, the past, the future mean nothing. It's this moment that really counts. Mm -hmm. So right now, this time with you is sacred to me, right? Because I, I see this moment is ever evolving. I, I don't live moment to moment. I live one moment. I was birds. There was a life before these, I consider obviously a spirit or soul. You were birds, you live, there's death, but there's going to be more than that. But this time is, it's just one moment that's just ever changing. Um, and by living in that, that root, being rooted in that helps me not worry about future life circumstances or be uh, defined by my past story. And so um, that is trying, that's trying to work in the message I try to bring to my patients and people I interact with and share now, because it's such a, a powerful way to live, um, but so joyous and free at the same time. Um, That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's the whole, it's the whole lifestyle, not just what, what people think of when they hear the term lifestyle medicine, yeah. but it really is walking that talk. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So I've, I've known you and worked with you for about, oh gosh, uh, over about four years now. And mm -hmm. you've given me and the patients you work with across the board uh, so much, uh, not only of yourself and, and of your vulnerability and authenticity, but really to the community. So you've gone from building this multi-physician practice and, and and all, you know, a couple of startups along the way to podcast hosts. Now you've even you've even taken that journey now into this healing kitchen mm -hmm. um, startup and movement, really. Mm -hmm. What's that journey been like for you? Yeah. So I think uh, a big part of that journey is understanding you just have to say yes. Um, yeah. And know that when there's a problem, there's a solution. Sometimes it's through the problem that you can see the solution. It's, it's the, there's a veil that needs to be removed by going through <laughs> the problem, uh, you know, go through the obstacle. There's, therein lies the solution and the opportunity. And so I would say, you know, um, when you seek life's adventures and that attitude, um, it comes really fun. And then you can reflect back and go, wow, all these serendipitous moments, coincidences weren't really, there weren't coincidences. These are the way it's supposed to be. And so the cool thing was that, you know, that, that even going back to medical school with the books, right. I drew cartoons because I had to survive medical school with three little kids. A husband was active duty. So mm -hmm. that's how I remember vast amounts of information with limited time circumstance. And um, then it turned into opportunities to publish and share that with others. And I'm, you know, I always, I always tease people as like, I don't know if you want me as your doctor. I literally made it to medical school on cartoons. And so um, <laughs> that's just the way that's how it works. And um, so it's just like with plant-based telehealth, right? There was an opportunity. There was a solution to a problem. People you'd go and speak why can't I find a plant-based doctor? And so we set uh, upon ourselves to find a solution and we implemented it. It was a lot of work. I learned some amazing lessons. Um, mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. And 
you have to have a different <laughs> mindset. Learning that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's it's not one that you take lightly. Um, but it's also such a joy to have that freedom. But with freedom comes struggle and responsibilities and harsher lessons. But again, it's all good. Um, so I'd say it's it's been a fun. And then the joy of the Healing Kitchen is really working with uh, Brittany, who who herself, right? So she lost 70 pounds. She's only 4'11", right? So pregnant. she's pregnant with her first baby as well, which is so fun. And, you know, seeing someone so young embrace this lifestyle and this way of thinking and understanding um, that her journey could offer um, opportunities to help others along the journey, right? With the food. And it's such a, such a way she presents it. And it's with such love and caring. And um, so people just are just drawn to her, just warm disposition. And so it's just fabulous. I just, I'm excited to work with her every, it's just fun. And so um, and then she had reached out to me last year and, you know, we, I was like, Hey, I have this idea. Let's, and it kind of, kind of came from, cause you did a video for more. It came out of this, mm -hmm. that idea of this healing kitchen. And I tried to work with a previous chef friend of mine, um, Martin Oswald, and we had done like the doc and chef, but we were, it wasn't the right time. It didn't take yeah. off. We just didn't have the time, but so that was, you know, playing around in my head, you set it on this shelf and it will come out when it's ready. And so um, she's like, yeah, let's do it. And um, so we meet Wednesdays uh, live every, every Wednesday, she gets two recipes and then I answer medical questions. And then we run two expert workshops, uh, which we guys, we should have you guys do one of our workshops. Uh, it would be fun. Um, yeah. So we present uh, an expert workshop, which, you know, mm -hmm. for years, of course, would be the food addiction piece. And and um, then I present a workshop as well and create an ebook because I love the teaching creating piece. Um, yeah. And uh, so let's say this this next week will be all about plant based 101. It'll be uh, everything from getting started like A to Z. If you've been on it for uh, the beginning or you're in the middle of it or you've been on it for decades, you know, all everything, uh, social pressures, what to be eating, what labs to be checking, all that. And so um that'll be this workshop but i've done one on osteoporosis psychology of weight loss the uh, yes. resistance um and uh plant-based labs um what others mm, there's so many um but anyway these 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 come from uh places listening to my patients listening to the audience and saying this is what we need mm -hmm. and just being open to being the vessel of that transformation of that information right and so and then creating it in a way that's uh, affordable as much as possible for the general um, audience. But um, yeah. yeah, so, yep. That's excellent, that. excellent. I love the, I love the partnership. I, um, I think it's so brilliant, the two of you. And she, you're right, she's, she's super approachable. She's gotten such a following from the recipes that she creates because she's very real. And even, in, even though I don't know Brittany, um, just sharing in the excitement of her first baby and mm -hmm. she's brought her, her whole family into the mix mm, um, yeah. for over the last yeah. few years of their journey together through from, from sickness and disease around, you know, using standard American food now to this life and vibrancy that they, a lot of them have the yeah. Jerry family has really shown what, what whole food plant-based nutrition can do. And I think what's really cool is, um, she lost her mom along the way with from breast cancer a few years ago, but her baby's due on her mother's birthday. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's, that's just beautiful. Amazing. I hope that baby arrives on the birthday. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, I know. Um, and so, um, but yeah, that is such a fun. Um, yeah, she's, she's fantastic. And she only has, she's going to touch so many lives. Yeah. I love it. I, I love mean, it that's kind of where we are too at real food recovery. We work with such a broad spectrum of people. So for us, we don't advocate for a certain eating style mm -hmm. because everyone is so different. Mm -hmm. Our, um, we say we're food plan neutral, but processed food free. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about what makes you lean into the whole food plant base versus telling, working with your patients and just saying, you got to cut out the processed food. Yeah. Where, where no. do you start? Where do you start? on? Yeah. The so that's a really fascinating 
evolution of my own journey um, as a doctor. So I would say, you know, I've always been healthy, right? And I've always preached mm-hmm. and tried to walk a walk of healthy eating, um, exercise, you know, stress reduction, sleep. But what was interesting, even though you would walk with patients and say, okay, this is what you need to do, the checkoff list approach. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly we can all, I think, regardless of the dietary pattern that you have chosen, removing ultra processed food is absolutely across the board, the most healthy thing you can do, right? Um, where does it get more nuanced for me uh, focused on whole food plant-based living is um, a place with a patient when I lived in <clears throat> Rifle, Colorado, 12 years ago, who came to me and she's like, Dr. Marbus, you know, meat and dairy upset my stomach. And I said, well, stop eating meat and dairy, <laughs> come back in 30 days intuitively understanding that there were foods she could consume, but it didn't leave me with the notion of, oh, this is a plant-based diet that I'm prescribing. It was just a diet of removing meat and dairy. And she came back in 30 days. I had always made notes, of course, in the chart about, you know, our conversation. So I knew what was to be expected, but what was interesting, she brought her daughter with her, who was 16 at the time, with her to the appointment. And I'm thinking to myself as a mother and a doctor and someone missing school to come to her mother's appointment going, what kind of conversation am I going to have? Is it going to be one about sex or drugs or what am I going to be dealing with? Because I had no clue. I was like, like, and so I walked in with a little apprehension. But what was interesting, the patient goes to her daughter and says, tell Dr. Marbus what you did. And I'm like, okay, here we go. <laughs> and <laughs> she goes, well you know, my, my mom was eating this way. So I thought I would support her. And I started cooking with her and I felt so good. I stopped both my attention deficit disorder medications. I was like, <gasps> oh, That's wow. really fascinating. And I was like, what? And she, her mom goes, yeah, she went, why was she able to do that? I said, I don't know, but that's by far the coolest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> and it really kind of got my brain going in a way it hadn't been before. Like I understood we don't need to be eating certain foods, Right. But a plant-based diet really took it to the next level. And so I sat down with them and I just kind of spoke to them about what they were doing. What were they doing? Fruits, veggies, beans, whole grains, nuts and seeds. Because there in Rifle, Colorado, there was no vegan right. restaurants. There was no place to buy these type of, or eat out, you know, which again, eating out can also be um, difficult to find truly healthy food. Um, but what that allowed me to do was a presence of mind to go and Google <laughs> as soon as the point was over a uh, plant-based diet. Cause it was like, there's plants and ADD. And what popped up was the China study. I ordered the China study by T. Tolan Campbell and his uh, son. And I came in two days. Thanks to Amazon. I read it in two days. I was freaking out going, what in the world you know that little emoji where the little head goes uh, <laughs> that literally is my brain for like two days and I remember sitting on the floor in our bedroom and my husband would walk by and I'm like it says right here you can turn off cancer with plants he's like okay he had no idea what was coming but at that point I was like trying to figure this out in my head because I'm a true believer I have to walk the model the behaviors that I'm see. I want others to follow, be it my children, my community, my, my patients, because I like to sleep at night and I have my mother, if anything she instilled in me was a guilty conscience. So I Mm -hmm. will try to avoid that guilty conscience as much as possible. And so, um, what happened was, um, I was really just processing reading as much as I could. There wasn't a ton about that information. Um, there was a few things, there was the nutrition facts, uh, dot org website that had you know but it wasn't like it is now um there was dr mcdougall had some uh articles for doctors who want to start doing this for patients but what happened was two weeks later Mm -hmm. as i was still kind of you know diving deeper into the rabbit hole uh i had a lupus patient uh come and she was younger than me at that time she had been diagnosed with lupus for about two years was 50 pounds overweight, won 12 different medications, headaches most days of the week, high doses of steroids, uh, on 
immune suppressing drugs, very strong drugs. And um, she's telling me in her, here she is in her late thirties, uh, Dr. Morris, I don't think I can keep working, right? So here's a young woman. And I would say, you know, what we consider the height of life or at that time, at least I thought. Um, and <laughs> this is, uh, she's like, not going to be able to sustain a living, provide for herself. She's got this devastating disease and she was just feeling hopeless the whole time she's like being vulnerable with me and I'm just sitting there smiling going I think this is the one I'm going to try plants I'm going to give this <laughs> first patient I'm going to purposely prescribe plants and she's like I'm sure looking at me like she even listening to me I was listening and I was I was I was thinking to myself how am I going to share this with her and it just blurted out. I was like, I think you should change what's on the end of your fork. And she's like, <laughs> so I was like, you know, I told her about the patients. I told her about my research and this anti-inflammatory, these anti-inflammatory foods and the nutrients and amazing things. And she's like, you know, I'll try anything. She was in such a place of suffering and loss that what was interesting, again, no coincidences, um, she was open to such a radical shift, right? And so she did what I told her, which was not very much, um, but we did measure her CRP, which is an inflammatory marker before she left. And it was three times high normal. She came back in two weeks. So they said, you know, I can't have you come back in a month because it's just this is too exciting. I'm very excited about what's going to happen. And she came back and uh, she was eight pounds lighter. Headaches were gone. Her uh, CRP dropped 300%. And... Wow. I was like astounded. Fast forward five months, lost 50 pounds off seven or 12 medications and eventually had negative um, uh, antibodies. So um, at that point of the two week follow up, it was a Friday night. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm done. Uh, it, I, I, I hear you. It's this is it. This works. Um, and I'll just figure out the details as we go along. Right. And I didn't have to have it all figured out, but I knew what I had to do that night. So I went home. <laughs> And I took a garbage bag. I threw everything out that was animal origin, eggs, meat, dairy, cheese, all in the garbage. I told the family, my poor husband, my husband, my kids were then, how old are they? 13, 15, and 18. I was like, we're going on a plant-based diet. And the kids were like, hmm. And so mom is going through another one of her things. She'll eventually come back around. My husband He's very kind. He's just like, are you still cooking? And he's like, <laughs> I said, yes. He goes, okay. And I'm like, okay. So I was very lucky, but I think there was a reason for the, the seamless transition. I wouldn't say seamless, but the e pretty easily transition. Cause obviously a lot of things have come out of that decision. And, but what was really funny is I stayed up late trying to figure out, you know, okay, now what do I cook? And then, you know, then the panic set in, but that was Friday. So Sunday we went to church came back and there was a quarter of a grass fed beef in my freezer. Cause I was like, what do I do with this? Cause I did, you live in Colorado. You don't just throw it out. And I'm not giving it to a human cause I'm determined that that's not healthy. So I'm sitting here, you know, in my head going, I don't know what to do. Do I give it again? What do I do? Animal shelter or what? But lo and behold, we come home and somewhere over the weekend, that freezer broke and all that meat has started to <laughs> defrost. I'm not kidding. There was literally liquid, Ooh. bodily yeah. fluids um yeah. rolling down the garage I still can smell it and see it to this day that, I, that happened at my house too that that's the worst yes. stench I've ever smelled when that yes. deep freeze breaks and that meat's in there uh -huh. it, it makes you gag so uh what happened was my husband's like well Lori if you hadn't been with me um, I would have sworn you unplugged this. And I was like, <laughs> uh, no, I'm pretty sure that that's God speaking and saying we're done. And yeah. I haven't had meat or dairy uh, since, and that's been 12 years. Yeah. And um, that's that moment um, when I and my husband, you know, we've been married, it'll be 31 years in April at that time was, oh my gosh, I don't know, 19, 20 years. And um he had gained weight over the course of time. He lost 70 pounds in three months and by going plant-based, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, I had never dealt with the weight issues, right? But um, what was interesting, I've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism since the birth of my second kiddo. See, he'll be 28 in April. So uh, 
almost 28 years now. And um, over the course of that summer, oh, well, my allergies disappeared. So I did have some allergies, um, but my thyroid improved to the point that my TSH was zero and I suffered some consequences of having too much medication. I had to sure. decrease my medication. I'm still on legal thyroxine, still in medicine I'm, I'm taking, but the but that was quite remarkable to see that even at that point, 15 years into a diagnosis of hypothyroidism, that okay. there could see some improvement. And that was really quite remarkable. Um, so yeah, so anyway, but that is literally... Um, how I jumped into the rabbit hole and have yet to emerge in, um, now. Yeah. You I never look back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's only been good. Only been good. It's interesting. One of the things that you mentioned about, you know, um, the, the stench, right. Of, of the rotting meat and, uh, or even just the defrosting meat it wasn't even necessarily rotting just yet, but that, that really got to me again, just as a, um, as a consumer, mm. I realized that, you know, if something had to be cooked like that or frozen like that um, or managed in a certain way um, to, to keep disease off of it, I thought, I don't know that I want to put that in my body. The same for dairy, right? Dairy has to be kept at a certain temperature and all of that. And mm. when I learned more about dairy's link to autoimmune and dairy's link to just all kinds of disease, I thought, okay, this is, this makes it easy. And it's so interesting. You say that you, read, you read the China study in, in two days, that book is like 800 pages. Yeah, so. dude, I can't even tell you, I was consuming it. Like I was starving and because it was like, but then again, I think I was just in a place I was ready. Cause I was right. seeing, like, I was becoming frustrated with not being able to work within the system of mm -hmm. medications and interventions, which are absolutely crucial still. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm glad we have these available and I'm not dissing or dismissing the need for those in appropriate cases, but mm -hmm. um, it, it never, we never highlight the value of these lifestyle interventions, these simple choices we make every single day and how they can be life altering for so many people. And sure. um, yeah, the, the plant-based diet is just a, a piece I feel like sleep and stress but even more so more than anything I think if you can walk out of um suffering and into understanding that once you connect with that deeper sense of who you are you start making different choices because you have a different relationship you see that you are different you're not your thoughts you're not your emotions you mm -hmm. are an observer of these. And once you connect with that and you build that presence in your life, you make different choices because you're coming from a different place. You're not coming one from scarcity or fear or exactly. anxiety or depression. You're making choices out of empowering courage because you are something like that. You are your essence, your, mm -hmm. what's the word? There's no way to describe it. The being that, sure. that strength, right? And so, um, yeah, so I... Uh, it's just different. And so that is the fun piece to try to help people see. It's really interesting. Um, I ask patients as they come in to join, you know, there's an intake form and mm -hmm. I ask them, I was like, you know, what are your values? What does your body, spirit, and mind need to heal? And it's really, the answers are really quite, if people are being transparent and, and um, truthful and really vulnerable, I get some really remarkable answers. In one visit that stood out, dramatically to me was she said you know Dr. Marvis nobody's ever asked me that and I never even thought about it she says I didn't even know what my values are and she started to cry and I was like here's a woman in her middle you know midlife who's lived a life without even understanding that she her values or you know yep. even having time or permission to reflect upon what is she here for what is her purpose what is her her joy right and so um, there's so much pain that comes from that, that evolves into habits of eating, habits of abuse, addiction, whether it be shopping, sex, uh, alcohol, you know, gambling, um, cause we get our egos get into the way of that so much because we're trying to live a story or hide or feed right. emotions and put them aside, you know, getting rid of things. And so, um, yeah, that, that is the powerful message that I think people need to hear. hundred percent. 
I think you are so in line with what we do at Real Food Recovery too, because we take that full all-encompassing approach too. We understand it's not just about the food. It cannot be about the food. So mm -hmm. it's like you said, the stress management, the sleep, the spirituality, the movement, all those different things. When we work with our clients, we we look at everything. Uh, I was, uh, we were in a meeting, a Zoom meeting today working with someone and she's fairly new and she was bringing up these things that we were working on with her. And she goes, <clears throat> you guys kind of create a sneak attack, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I laughed so hard. She said, you know, before you knew, knew it, I was in here. Now I'm journaling and now I'm thinking deeply about my thoughts and how um, what's happening in my mind connects to the food addiction. So I just, I have not stopped laughing about that. We take a awesome. sneak attack. That's hilarious. <laughs> I know. Go so, sneakiness, go. <laughs> that's powerful. <laughs> yeah. And you said something about values too, Lori. And I think yeah. that's something that's so so Paige and I have one of our, you know, we have these branches of recovery, right? Which is really all they are, are just 16 sources of dopamine, yeah. 16, 16 alternatives to the food. Mm -hmm. And one of them is personal values, alignment with personal values. And mm -hmm. I remember in, it was 2016. I had no idea I was coming out of a marriage at the time. I, I had lost a bunch of weight, but I had no idea who I was no idea who I was. And I was white knuckling, you know, dry drunk around food, trying to, to moderate processed foods at the time. And, um, I, I might've looked different, but I certainly was progressing with my illness and internally and in my head. And, um, I was living in, a, in an apartment in Houston that became this sort of think tank where I started to map out my personal values on this big whiteboard. And I was like, I don't even know who I am, what I stand for, what, what matters to me. I have no idea. And I was, in, I was 40 years old and I started to do the process of literally writing everything out. And I had this big list that I whittled down to five and I live by those five. Mm -hmm. um, and when I don't live by those five, I feel it. Mm -hmm. I feel it. it affects every aspect of, of everything that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we've done is we've taken this personal value, you know, this whole experience, we brought it to our members. We do workshops around it. We have done a podcast on it. We talk about it with our members on the regular because it's something that is so important for people to understand. When Paige and I even created Real Food Recovery, we sat yeah. down with our mission and vision. We created them together, talked about the values of the organization we wanted to build, and we and we try our very best to lead by those values. Mm. And yeah. if we don't, we hold each other accountable and say, Hey, are you, are, you know, are you living by these values? And if not, what's going on? Mm, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. It, it has to be that way. Right. Right. It just, it, in order to have a big, beautiful life, it has to be bigger than, well, you know, what our, we do is we have an online food addiction recovery community. And so we understand that your life gets bigger like Jamie said, we've got these 16 branches when you can practice those and it takes you out of the food and back into life. Yeah. So I'm sure that you work with people that are on somewhere on the food addiction spectrum. Yeah. What do you do? How do you handle your patients? What's your recommendation there? What's your stance on even yeah. on food addiction? That, that I think oh, would be there's definitely hard. a food addiction, right? Just because Thank there's you. no <laughs> DSMR. <laughs> uh, I think there's uh, entities in our world that would make it difficult to state this is food addiction because then there will be some type of um, economic backlash to right. uh, uh, entities that are beyond <laughs> our, our ability to deal with. But that's that's is that we're working with what we got. Um, one, I I come from it from two ways. Um, I tell people, you know, you have. Uh, a habit of eating food in these circumstances. So I try to describe it where I'm not giving them another label or diagnosis because I feel like sometimes people um, want to attach a label to themselves so they can have an excuse not to change because like, I just have food addiction. I just made poor choice because I have a disease. I have food addiction and, um, or I have whatever, right. I have type two diabetes. So, you know, my blood sugar is going to be out of control. So I just take more medications. Um, and so I try to really first understand and, and teach them, um, or not even teach, just, uh, help them be aware of 
what is occurring and understanding what habits are, how our brain works, how we're developing these neural tracks and why, right? And once they understand that, they're like, huh. And they, they can be an orchestra. They can really be the conductor of their life symphony, right? So they can really choose to remove uh, someone that's out of a line or out of tune with another player, right? But the whole goal is to understand that that reward center needs to be dismantled and dampened, right? We can change prompts, we can change triggers, we can change behaviors and substitute, but it never gets really rid of the root cause, which is the emotional dysregulation, the um, pain, the, the struggle, where it all came from. So that, you know, once they start understanding that, they can start working in their own mind. Maybe they need to get counseling. Sometimes that works for people. Other times they can do it um, with just being aware. And um, so that's how I try to approach it where it's uh, and give them a tool of mindfulness and tool of presence and awareness, because so many of us live in this rush world and it's just harder and harder and harder. I feel like we're getting tighter, 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 constricted. Um, but there is seems to be a growing uh, presence and understanding and um, people coming out of the shell, so to speak. It's like, well, we can't keep doing this. We have to change something and yeah. um that is the first step into to seeing hopefully society wide changes but it starts with the individual um but okay. that's kind of how i like to work at it is like okay let's look at the tools let's make this a very sometimes it's a emotional discussion sometimes it's a very um lecture type it depends on the person right because everyone will respond a little differently but everyone needs to understand that your brain is just trying to do the best it could right and um, you know, it's like we'd mentioned about Judd Brewer's work and it's, it's so, it's got a very practical approach to it and makes it very approachable for everyday persons. So it's a fantastic, uh, book by him is, uh, the hunger habits. It's just his newest book. And, um, he's also plant-based by the way. Um, yeah. so, but yeah, so that's some amazing, um, things, uh, tools, but yeah, so it absolutely exists. And if someone comes to me, is like, I'm a food addict. I'm like, okay, so you have food addiction. You aren't right. necessarily, and you guys may disagree, but I'm, I'm a big fan of removing labels yeah. um, because if we have a label, it's very easy to remain attached to that label and it will dictate your thoughts and your behaviors for sure. Yeah, we definitely say you are not your addiction. You right. have an addiction. You are not your addiction. Yeah. Right. Let, let's yeah. see what we can do with that. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that one of our leaders, we have, there's four leaders, including Paige and I of, of the community. And one of our leaders has built this, this, we call a sort of a mini program. Um, one of the ways that Paige and I look at it as uh, it's called Real Food Mastery. And it's, it's really just bringing folks into this whole idea of um, needing and connecting with the areas of their life that they, that they want to shore up food is what brings them in um most of the uh, most of the folks that come into real food mastery again it's it meets once a week it's much less intensive than a recovery program like the one we built but it's it kind of introduces these these ideas without calling it addiction right. uh it and she you know heather heather hewitt leads it she's, she's so skilled um and and just talking about these are the behaviors and, and yes, once you get the food in a place where you can figure out that it's whole unprocessed single ingredient foods, plant, plant driven, mm -hmm. then we've got a lot of those members coming now and saying, I need more than just the food. Mm -hmm. uh, it's bigger. It's bigger to me. And Heather's, you know, um, her whole concept was that so many people are um resistant to this whole label or or idea even of food addiction they don't want to think of themselves as addicted they don't want to think about food as addictive mm -hmm. or the way they respond to it um and then we're able to sort of explain to them in this real food mastery program which is sort of a farm team for mm -hmm. for what we're building at real food recovery mm -hmm. we're able to explain to them that you are acting exactly the way that you were designed to act given the hyper palatable foods that are available everywhere and marketed mm -hmm. everywhere and are cues and triggers everywhere around us, you're acting exactly the way that your brain was wired to act and the food companies know it and the marketers mm -hmm. know it. Mm -hmm. So we can remove that shame mm -hmm. um, 
and I would say that it really does work, but it is so interesting because we don't want to label anyone. And we find that there are, there's a subset of folks that, that are in that addictive cycle that really do not want to understandably right. do not want to admit it. Right. So, well, then it means that you have to admit you have something you're out of control with, right? Which is hard for some. You're, you're well, and you're, you're basically attacking something that they've identified with, like like you're you're telling them something that you're like it, it's hard for someone to settle for a diagnosis even or like you have this problem they get very defensive because they don't it's like wait this isn't working or it's a it's a they're saying it's kind of like this reminds me of this real quick um i gone out to eat with some people i didn't know very well years ago did my plant-based thing you know it's of course it's colorful and yummy someone's like oh so are you, why are you eating this? And I was like, well, I eat a plant-based diet and just was going to leave it at that. She goes, looks at her plate and looks at me. And so, so you're saying what I'm eating isn't healthy. <laughs> ah. I can do this two things here. I can give you my answer, but you got to, you ask, but I could tell by the tone and the, the reference that is like, so let's get in this discussion because I'm going to tell you what I'm doing is still right. How dare you tell me that I'm wrong? You know, that's how they take it. Even though you're giving them in a loving, they're going to construct it and see it the way they want. Totally. So I totally, totally get it. I have patients do the same thing. They say, I'm going to embrace this plant-based diet, but they will tell me, but the, you know, there are still 200 pounds overweight. You're not eating oatmeal in your salads. Like everything they tell me is like, it's just, it's just not going, it's not happening. Right. So they're, they're telling me a story, but I know what's going like as we start talking they start yeah. telling me more. They're like, well, yeah, I am going out and I'm still doing this. I'm like, okay. And there's no judgment yeah. here. You mm -hmm. can choose whatever you want. I just want you to make mindful choices. Mm -hmm. So when you see you're in this cycle of this habit, let's give yourself a, a time and space, let the craving and you can observe it. Then you can make a choice. You indulge in it or you don't, but at least you've made a mindful choice. You're yeah. in this present moment, making a choice based on whether you think this aligns with your values or not. And then it's okay. There's no shame, no judgment. You right. do you, but at least now, you know, yep. and so yep. that's, yep. that's, that's yep. all we can do. That's exactly where I was when I kind of figured out the science behind it and it lined up to how I reacted. I had relief. I was yeah. grateful because then now I had something to work with. I understood mm -hmm. it and I knew what to do from there. But before I was just like, these cravings just come over me and come over me and come over me. I have no idea what's going on. Why is this happening? Why can't I control myself, you know, mm. with these, when these big binges come on a couple of times a month mm. and I, and nobody else was talking about it. So I thought, I mean, I'm not going to talk about it with my girlfriends. Nobody else is talking about it. But once I figured out the science, I, it was such a huge relief mm. to understand this wasn't my fault. Mm. And like Jamie said, I was responding exactly the way that specific food was meant for me to respond. Right. right. You're just doing the, what your body was doing, what it should do. It's like, mm, calories down. Remember eat. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. it, but you don't, there's the willpower piece is such a myth when it comes to this. Oh, life, right. So it's yeah. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You do a whole nother podcast on the myth of willpower. Yeah. 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 For sure. What do you think, you know, you've talked so much about um, the, the journey into this, this lifestyle. And that's why I love, you know, I know that there's others in the world who will talk about plant exclusive, uh, but I love the whole theme of plant based because one of the, one of the ways that we get folks closer to help is to get them to, you know, crowd out, right? The crowding mm. out strategy where they're crowding out what they're eating now with, with nutrient dense foods. Mm. And one of the things that I talked about the other, the other night with our members was, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So if we're constantly talking about the foods we can't eat or the foods we don't, you know, we shouldn't eat or, you know, whatever the, the vernacular is, mm. isn't, isn't that setting us up to just be like, okay, well, what do I do? So I said, what if we think about flip the script and think about it from a, here's what I, I'm going to be focused on. I'm not, I'm not necessarily, uh, um, avoiding addictive foods mm. anymore. What if I'm, or, or, you know, removing addictive foods, mm. what if I'm adding in nutrient dense foods, mm. nutrient dense plant-based foods specifically, 
And I'm not talking about mac macronutrients. I'm talking about micronutrients. Mm -hmm. What is what foods can I choose that are going to have the most micronutrients, the most fiber, the most water, mm -hmm. um, and the most color mm -hmm. for for my life? Uh, you know, Cheetos don't count, right? So what what does that look like? <laughs> And instead of thinking about what they can't have, think about what they can and leading with that and crowding out the other stuff. And I will tell you, I have gone a little bit towards a raw journey mm -hmm. in this phase of my recovery. And it has been a game changer, mm -hmm. game changer. And I'm very careful with our community because I don't, everyone's very impressionable. And I, and I, that's, that's been something that I've found a lot of joy in for me, but it doesn't necessarily mean everyone you know, needs to jump on the bandwagon. So I share, I share in a limited way mm -hmm. about it, but I know that you went on a raw journey for the first part of this year for a few, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks, right? Or 10 a days. Month. A month, a month. Uh, cause my youngest uh, challenged me to it. So all my kids are plant-based. Uh, oh. My uh, youngest, more of the ethical vegan at this point, he, mm -hmm. he makes healthier choices still, but I mean, his his conditioning is that this is animals. I mean, the suffering involved is mm -hmm. tremendous and there's no need for it. The middle one is like, it's just a healthier thing to do. My daughter is really in touch with the climate change piece of it. So mm -hmm. there's so many wins to going on a plant-based diet, but yeah, um, the crowding out is a fantastic way to approach that, but being raw, I loved it, but, um, I still, I still wanted beans. I don't do a lot mm -hmm. of greens just because yeah. I, I just never really did a lot of greens. Uh, I definitely do more starchy veggies, like potatoes, you know, sweet potatoes, things like that. But yeah. beans and vegetables are my thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love beans. Um, grew up on beans. <laughs> Again, if you come from a home without much money, beans and potatoes are where it's at. We eat beans almost every day. So um fruits is uh i would say fruits probably i'm trying to think i'm looking at my fruit over here um you know my breakfast is always typically raw lunch is usually 90 percent raw just because it's mm -hmm. a salad many times uh but i start throwing in my beans and stuff and then dinner is usually a warmer meal soup yeah. Yeah. do some type like last night i made burritos right um mm -hmm. like two different beans there's veggies there's whole grain tortillas, um, salsa, guac, that type of stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So that, like yeah. that, that approach, that's not, it's not staunch, but it's, um, I find that that, and again, I, if I, you know, there are most days that I'm about 80% and I'll have some cooked foods yeah. at, at night. Um, and I really, I can't believe the, um, the benefits I've seen yeah. in, I was having some joint issues from grains. I was noticing mm. some things, grains that I'd been able to eat mm -hmm. for years, in, mm. in this way and all of a sudden this last few months it's like mm -mm. Mm. so I'm I'm noticing that different phases and stages of life and now I was ahead into this perimenopause phase of my life oh, I'm yeah. noticing that that foods that worked for me before don't work yeah. for me as as much yeah, yeah. being in my mid-50s has uh <laughs> you're, you're definitely in a different phase of life like you <laughs> yeah 10 years ago is a very different body than my I may look the same in that sense but it's internally there is some there are some changes that occur with menopause that is a whole nother discussion on menopause and our approach to it and the research and how it was misinterpreted uh, and you know where hormone replacement <laughs> therapy can be mm -hmm. a very important piece to this journey and we should be very open to that discussion Mm -hmm. um so uh, absolutely so i think that's, I love a, that, yeah. that's a, another piece to it we'll have to have you back we'll have to have yeah, you back. i would love to talk about that mm. that would be i mean our audience demographic would be very people mm. yeah i totally get you <laughs> so any projects you want to talk about dr marvis anything other than what mm. we've touched on uh, let's see. Um, I'm about to release a, a three month course uh, called the psychology of weight loss. It builds upon the mindfulness muscle, Fred Jibber, BJ Fogg, that type of thing, just really get into the science of it. And then part of that is also creating the habits based on a whole food plant-based diet or plant slant diet, restorative mm -hmm. sleep, stress management, mindful movement with exercise. Yeah. I think there's a piece of just it needs to be more than exercise. It needs to be really be a place of mindful movement. Um, 
and then social uh, relationships, um, because I think that that's really important. So journaling is a big piece of this, um, but then I do monthly and life coaching. So it'll be as an ongoing okay. thing. And, uh, and then I have my glucose mastermind, which is a three month deep dive, small group where I give everybody there a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, and we meet regularly for uh, three hours a month, uh, hour and a half, twice a month. And we walk through what um, their body's doing in glucose. And it's a, it's just a, a data point for discussion. And so um, really interesting things help people understand they get really tied up and anxious about things, but that's what a wonderful place to talk about stress um, and how to do that and what looking at data and stuff in the judgment. And so it's been a really interesting evolution. And so that starts, my next group starts um, in March. I love it. I love it. I love it. And of course, the healing kitchen. Yeah. And the healing kitchen, of course, is ongoing. I do want to ask you one last question. What's your greatest piece of advice for people that come to you and want to start on a health journey, whether it be food addiction or the plant-based lifestyle or just health in general? Do you have a piece of advice that helps them get started? I think, you know, that's evolved as well as I've talked to people and really just honed in i think one is um take a moment provide space in your life for reflection of two things one is what are your greatest senses of value and two i ask them to accept that the only constant in life is change and Mm -hmm. once they start reflecting upon that um life gets a lot less stressful and that allows me to start introducing these big concepts of changing your diet and exercising and working on stress. <laughs> so, <laughs> because now we have an anchor and a foundation mm-hmm. and um, until that's in place, I find that people really still struggle because we're, we're throwing, you know, the fire still going, we haven't put out the fire and now we can start putting in, you know, better plants. And so I think yeah. aligning your life with values, you know, and understanding that change is going to be constant and that helps build resilience and acceptance and, um, the skill set of flexibility, psychological flexibility is so essential to being successful in anything in life. And especially the undertaking of health and all the challenges that are in our environment. Um, until that can be in place, uh, I think you're going to continue to struggle. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant way to end. Thank Agreed. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paige, for your for your time and, and, and the questions you asked. And thank you, Dr. Marvis, for joining us. There are many topics that we could circle back with you on and <laughs> just thank you for being a, a friend of our far, certainly yes. a, a friend to me and for being such a champion uh, yes. for, for yes. my journey. I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And we'll have to have you on my podcast, both of you. I think it'd be a blast. Oh, so. We would love oh. that so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you want to know more about us, you can find us at realfoodrecoveryforyou.com. That's the number four, the letter U. And that tells all about our online food addiction recovery community. And we would love to see you there. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye-bye. Take care.